Hello everyone, this video is in response to Long Story Short, so let's jump right in. To recap, LSS made a video published on the Discovery Institute's channel on homology. We covered the many errors contained in that video in our own Misunderstanding Homology. Now LSS has made a reply to that video published on his own channel. I can't say I'm impressed. He didn't really address my counterpoints. Instead, he included a few lines of me expressing my disagreements but omitted the explanations for them, so I will include them here. I will also try to keep this as brief as possible. But for those who are interested, there is a link in the description to a full response. And here's something interesting. Naturalists like Ernst Haeckel recognize that whales are closely related to hooved mammals. Up until this point, Jackson uses the term similar, but now he uses the term related. To him, this kind of similarity means relatedness. I didn't say similarity means relatedness. The point was that the pattern of both similarities and differences is what makes homology strong evidence for common descent. While making that point, I made a quick side note that Heckel even noticed that whales were closely related to hooved mammals. But even then, I didn't use the words similar and related as if they were interchangeable. I mean, compare a whale to a deer. They don't outwardly look that similar. The distribution of organismal traits forming a nested hierarchy is exactly what is expected from evolution and common ancestry. This claim of nested hierarchy is a fine argument until you look at it closely. He then proceeds to give three alleged problems he has with cladistics. The arguments he makes hinge on profound misunderstandings of both paleontology and cladistics. However, I didn't use cladistics to argue for the nested hierarchy. As I said, humans have noticed this for ages, but Carolus Linnaeus was the first to construct a method of classification to describe this observation. He didn't find that animals were classified as distinct kinds, instead they formed a nested hierarchy. Basically, with his method of taxonomy, Linnaeus constructed an evolutionary tree without even knowing what it was. Just in case you didn't know, Linnaeus lived before cladistics was a thing. The way LSS frames Dr. Barrow's analogy is quite misleading, making it seem as though the Corvette analogy was specifically intended as an argument for why homology is best explained by common descent and not by common design. I'm not sure how I misframed this analogy. Well, you should have played the clip a little bit further. You make it sound like Barra intended for his analogy to be an answer to your question of homology being best explained by common descent or design. Instead, Barra used it in his 1990 book to get across the idea of how successive, slightly different forms, as seen in the fossil record of human evolution, eventually lead to quite different appearances. That was the point of the analogy to convey the concept of a gradual succession towards increasingly different forms, he made it more easily understandable for the layman by giving a more familiar example. It wasn't presented to explain the evidence and certainly not presented as evidence for common descent over design. Not even remotely. Next up. So why would the agent follow the pattern expected by common descent as opposed to literally any other pattern? For one, it doesn't, as already explained, but for two, Notice that this is a purely psychological objection. The hidden, faulty assumption is that a designer would create de novo rather than from a common pattern. I didn't make that assumption. I asked a question. Why would the designer follow the pattern of common descent and not any other pattern? LSS response basically boils down to, well, why wouldn't he? Which, of course, is not an answer. The point of the matter is that design doesn't make any predictions while common descent does. That is why common design and common descent give very different explanations for why this is so. Common descent obviously explains it by saying that as successive forms are slightly modified versions of their ancestors, complex traits can't simply jump around the tree of life. Instead, they fall into a nested hierarchy. There's that word again. Common design, on the other hand, can only say the designer just decided to do it that way for some reason. The former is a testable hypothesis, while the latter is merely ad hoc. Alright, moving on. We don't see this kind of absurd mosaicism in nature. May I introduce you to my friendly duck-billed platypus? Are you joking? Like, really? 
The platypus is not some absurd mosaicism, it is a mammal, specifically a monotreme. That's where it fits within the nested hierarchy of life. LSS has stated that the platypus is a, quote, mammal that has the bill of a duck, body and fur of an otter, web feet and eggs of a bird, venom of a reptile, electrolocation of a fish, close quote. The bill of the platypus is not made of hard keratin like that of a duck. It's covered with soft skin, and the skeletal structure underneath is quite different, so the only resemblance is the outer shape. Of course, it has fur. It's a mammal, after all. It's not uniquely otter fur, nor is its body. The webbing is also different from that of birds, as the webbing of its front feet extend beyond even the nails. Not to mention the skeletal structure of the feet are not the same. Egg laying is an ancestral characteristic of amniotes, so seeing a mammal that lays eggs isn't very surprising when you understand phylogeny. This is similarly true for the heel spurs, which are only found in monotremes and extinct mammalia forms. It's a trait that therian mammals, placentals and marsupials, lost, just like the shelled egg. The venom itself is also distinct. The only resemblance is that some of the components of both were co-opted from the beta defensin protein family, although they originated from different beta defensin lineages. The electroreceptors of fish are based on lateral line organs, whereas those of the platypus are based on cutaneous glands innervated by branches of the fifth cranial nerve. Those glands are structurally similar to sweat glands, which is a thing that mammals are known to have. So the platypus isn't a mosaic that LSS thinks it is. Give homology whatever definition that you want. Knock yourself out. But here's the point. If you define homology in terms of common ancestry, it can't be used as evidence for common ancestry. I already addressed this here. The biggest flaw in textbook descriptions of homology is that they, like Wells and, long story short, tend to confuse the definition of homology with the diagnosis of homologous features. Textbooks need to state explicitly that homologies are similarities seen in the biological world that are best explained as being due to common descent. They should then explain how homologous structures are diagnosed by their similar structure and position, biochemical basis, developmental path, and so on. A more detailed and lengthened discussion would help to remove the appearance of circularity caused by oversimplified descriptions. Finally, adding the notions of multiple layers of homology from genetics and developmental biology would better show students just how different lines of evidence converge to support homologies and phylogenies. I also showed an example of a textbook that explained why homology is evidence for common descent in a way that isn't circular. LSS has a person saying no one could make the mistake of saying homology is similarity due to common ancestry and then uses it as evidence of evolution while citing the Talk Origins page that debunks his argument in the bottom left of the screen. Ah, you're killing me, Wheat. They say nobody makes this mistake, and I show over a dozen examples, including yours, where people make this mistake. But, as we pointed out, LSS quotes one line from Talk Origins at the bottom left of the screen. To mine this line out of context, LSS misrepresents Talk Origins as if they were claiming that nobody would make this mistake. That's not what it says. After that first line, it continues on explaining the exact same thing that I just did, which debunks their whole argument. And it isn't that LSS just stopped reading after the first line. During our one-on-one -on -one discussion, I actually read this very Talk Origins page to him, so he knows about it, which means he deliberately chose to omit the very rebuttal to their argument on purpose. Next, LSS gets to the part where we criticized him for saying more and more people are seeing the problem for what it is while citing two papers written literally decades ago. His only response to this is, and I quote, Huh. I hate to break it to you, LSS, but that's not a rebuttal. Next. It's true that there have been opponents to this redefinition in the past, but not on the simplistic and misleading grounds that LSS presents in this video. Okay, let's take a look at the quotes. LSS then proceeds to read the same quotes from those papers that he used, apparently not realizing that these papers are much longer and contain more nuanced arguments compared to his simplistic way of dismissing homology as evidence for evolution. The authors also did not reject homology from the evolutionary paradigm as irrelevant. Far from it. The 1947 Boyden paper says, quote, let homology represent the great idea of structural correspondence, which is now and always has been the central concept of comparative morphology and of taxonomy and phylogeny as well. Let us realize once and for all that ancestry is inferred from essential similarities 
and therefore it is our supreme task to study and compare and analyze these and then to classify organisms according to the amounts and kinds of such resemblances revealed in our research, close quote. And the 1985 Brady paper says, quote, Darwin's theory explained, that is, the pattern found in nature independently of his theory. On this argument, the common plan slash standard part pattern of organisms is the fact to be explained, and the hypothetical process suggested by Darwin performs that explanation. Homology becomes, therefore, an independent evidence for Darwin's proposal, perhaps the most important evidence, since it constitutes the empirical pattern of transformation, without which the hypothesis that one species may be transformed into another would necessarily be a non-starter. But since the notion of transformation was central to morphology by the time Darwin began his studies, he had only to flesh out the mysterious pattern of transformation, the varied executions of the same common plan, with the hypothetical process of transformation, the historical production of one species from another, close quote. Then LSS goes on citing a textbook by Mark Ridley as evidence that more and more textbooks are rejecting the circularity of homology. However, this textbook has a whole paragraph explaining how homology is evidence for common ancestry. And again, it does that in a way that isn't circular at all. If your goal was to point out that homology as evidence for common ancestry isn't inherently circular, well, good job, you've proven the point for me. LSS claims Hennig simply redefined circular reasoning as reciprocal illumination, which is extremely misleading. Okay, so first of all, a little bit upset that you cut a really good joke. I worked hard on that one. But more importantly, just because you disagree doesn't mean it's misleading. I did more than just disagree. As I explained, Hennig, 1966, argued that the relationship between homology and ancestry isn't any more logically circular than the rest of science, where hypotheses are constantly tested against the larger theory every time when new data is available. Hypotheses are generated on data and then compared to further data. The key point is the consilience between the parts and the whole that gets built up. As Hennig explains in his book Phylogenetic Systematics, quote, In reality, phylogenetic systematics uses a method known and employed in all sciences, which in the humanities is called the, the method of reciprocal illumination, checking, correcting, and rechecking of the Anglo-Saxon authors, close quote. All right, next point. Also, that NCSE quote didn't say that homology has to be given up as evidence for common descent. Okay, let's take a look. Homology is not evidence for common ancestry. Hmm. Seems pretty plain to me, but... Of course, that one line isn't the only thing that NCSE said, as I have explained here. They effectively say the same thing as talk origins. Homology isn't evidence for common descent in the sense that we simply assert traits X, Y, and Z are homologous, therefore common descent. We first infer common ancestry based on many lines of data and determine whether a particular shared trait is due to common descent or not. Only then is the homology label applied. The consistency of the evidence leading to the label is what is being referred to when we say homology is evidence of common ancestry. Next, LSS says... Yeah, good catch on the nuance. There were two studies that proved you wrong and not just one, but I don't see how that helps your case very much though. The actual point was that this easily noticeable mistake made it clear that you haven't read your own citations. The papers still demonstrate the conflicting trees, and my point still stands. You haven't actually answered anything. As a matter of fact, I actually did. However, when we look up the original 1998 paper by Andrews et al., from which the weird primate tree based on Cytochrome B claim comes from, we can see the figure that includes the statistical certainty for each branch. This is the maximum likelihood tree based on 10 mammalian cytochrome B nucleotide sequences. Some branches show high certainty, such as the one given for humans, colobus monkeys, and squirrel monkeys has a near 100% likelihood, and the one for the bush baby and loris has an 84.9% likelihood. Both of these relationships match the accepted phylogeny. However, for the other relationships that deviate from this, their certainties are rather low, lower than 25%, meaning these deviations from the accepted phylogeny are not well supported. Furthermore, this tree was just the one with the maximum likelihood, meaning the branching order of this particular tree gives the highest average likelihood among all possible trees that can account for the data that was used. Bear in mind that with 
Even just 10 species, there are over 34 million possible trees you can reconstruct. So finding the correct one isn't easy to say the least. But that's not all. Even if you determine the maximum likelihood tree, there often are still other possible trees with only a slightly lower likelihood. And indeed, Andrew et al. found 1,731 other trees for which the likelihoods aren't significantly different from that of the maximum likelihood tree. And these trees included the accepted phylogeny for these 10 mammals. In other words, the data from cytochrome B does not significantly support this discordant tree that LSS referenced in favor of the accepted phylogeny for these 10 mammals. For these and other reasons, Andrew et al. concluded, quote, only two groupings of species are clearly resolved by the cytochrome B data. These are the simian primates and the lorosoid strepsorine primates. The branching order of the other taxa, including Tarsius bencanus and Limercata, cannot be determined from the data, close quote. Once again, completely refuting the claim that all genes should always show the same tree, and it blows the cytochrome B argument completely out of the water. I haven't answered anything, have I? Hmm, next. You know, honestly, I'm feeling pretty good if these are the kinds of things that you're picking at. Not reading your own citations isn't something you should be feeling good about. Anyway, it was assumed that the inclusion of more molecules and more data in the analysis would eliminate the discrepancies, but that hasn't happened. That's why the scientists in the cited papers are so surprised and disappointed. Yes, they no longer expect to find reasonably consistent family trees. The evidence has crushed their hopes like a soggy old grape. I don't see how that undermines the case that I'm making. That's exactly what I was trying to say. LSS is still arguing from the flawed thinking that if Darwinism is true, we should expect reasonably consistent trees pretty much no matter what genes we pick. However, I pointed out that this isn't true. Indeed, a limited amount of data is a factor that can influence the results, which is the only one LSS is seemingly aware of, but it is far from the only factor. I even mentioned specific examples, such as horizontal gene transfer and incomplete lineage sorting, which explain why we certainly do not expect the same thing that LSS is expecting from what he calls Darwinism. So LSS pointing to incongruences, such as the aforementioned cytochrome B example, doesn't give credence to his case whatsoever. It only demonstrates the false assumptions that stem from his own ignorance of the subject. So that's the answer I gave. The very one he asserted, I didn't. If he disagreed with the answer, he should have addressed that, not just ignore it. To make things worse, he included a new citation to a review article with the title, Who Speaks with a Forked Tongue, that says the following, quote, Problems with molecular analyses stem from overly simplistic substitution models that fail to account for details of genome evolution, confusion arising from gene duplication, and missing genes. None of these exemplify inherent problems with molecular data, but rather false assumptions about how genomes evolve, close quote. Just another example of LSS's own citations speaking against his arguments. On a final but anticlimactic note, LSS ends by insinuating that the Discovery Institute simply wants to advocate for intelligent design, not creationism. Nobody is hiding the ball, he says. I suggested that he look up the Dover trial that exposed the ID movement for what it is, or take a good read from the Wedge document. And he said I was trying to pass off AIG's statement of faith as though it was from the Discovery Institute. When I showed that screenshot, I stated that creationist organizations in general are well known for their statements of faith. I obviously wasn't referring to the Discovery Institute regarding that. You can even clearly see from the very screenshot that it is from Answers in Genesis. Nothing about it is sneaky. And that's it. In my opinion, uh, LSS' response to my video has failed miserably, to say the least. He didn't actually address our points. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.